Why did I first write the book? Well, it came out of a conversation with Marika Grover, the wife of my friend, the publisher Mike Grover, who asked me, 1993-ish, uh, to write a book for parents. And the second influence was I uh, was getting letters from parents um, about particular problems they were having in raising their children bilingually, uh, to which I had to try to find answers. And thirdly, and most importantly, Anwen, my wife and myself, had by then raised uh, three bilingual children, and that provided the experience and the stimulus to write uh, this book. Well, perhaps first and foremost is that since the early 1980s, I've been writing books on bilingualism, and hence this book has a secure academic uh, foundation. That is important. Otherwise, it's going to be based on hearsay and perhaps limited experience. The second uh, influence has been talking to parents and teachers. Uh, I often have run parent classes, and not only in North Wales, but elsewhere as well. And one of the delightful things is that parents always come up with tough questions to which you have to find answers. Uh, and therefore, um, the book is, reflects those questions and the answers. Um, and I'm, obviously, my children, um, Sarah, Rodri and Bartwell, uh, Amon and I have brought those up bilingually using the Opal method, one parent, one language. And that provided some grounded experience in raising children bilingually. Well, not much to be honest. It's been fairly stable. It has become more refined um, and perhaps more elaborate and more detailed. Um, but most of the views have been fairly secure, I think, over time. A few topics have changed. Um, I think, first of all, the need to separate languages. The early editions tend to emphasise the importance of keeping languages separate, so both came secure. I think research has shown that that is not necessarily uh, needed all the time, and it's quite okay for, in many situations, to mix languages, because children do manage to separate their languages fairly easy. The second thing that has changed is um, research on babies in the womb. Um, who have bilingual input even at that stage. And I learned from that research that bilingualism actually starts in the womb and not in the early days or indeed uh, at the end of the first year. The third thing that's changed, I think, is awareness that teenagers can be very challenging, that it's not always easy to bring up children bilingually. And during the teenage years, there are often many challenges uh, that are made. And Children don't always do as their parents want or expect and therefore languages have a life of their own and that children themselves decide in the end which direction they want to go. Um, that's not always negative because funny enough children who may reject a minority language for a short while often come back to it and the number of people who I've met in particularly in parents classes who said um, they are so grateful for their parents bringing them up bilingually. They didn't always realise it in their childhood or their teenage years, but later on they realised what an incredible gift it is. Well, I've learned particularly from parent classes, um, meeting so many people who brought up their children bilingually, that it is not quite so easy as some people think it is raising children bilingually. It has its challenges, it has its problems, it has its uncertainties. There are many worries and anxieties that parents have, um, particularly that children will become balanced bilinguals, which is fairly rare. Many children don't have equal, two equal languages or even three equal languages. Um, but the advice to parents is don't get despondent. Um, yes, there are temporary flips, there are temporary problems, but in the long term, it's worth it. Keep trying. Um, there's more on multilingual children, uh, as a, different from bilingual children. Uh, there's more on children mixing languages. Um, parents have great concerns and anxieties about children who mix their languages. I've discussed that more. More about influence of the womb, 
um, a little bit more about stuttering and stammering, um, which is a worry to some parents in raising bilingual children. Um, some new material on the effect of brothers and sisters, um, but also on the effects of information technology, the internet, um, technical advances, the effect that these are having on bilingualism and on raising children bilingually. Well, this relates to my favourite talk to parents uh, and teachers as well, um, where I basically list the 10 advantages of bilingualism. And uh, those 10 advantages form into six groups, um, which all start with the letter C. If I read them, communication advantages, cultural advantages, cognitive, i.e. thinking advantages, character advantages, curriculum advantages, which is about doing well at school, and cash advantages. If I were just to pick out two of those, it would be cognitive, which is the thinking advantages of bilingualism. There's now masses of research which shows that bilingual children who have two fairly well-developed languages um, have extra thinking advantages over monolinguals. Um, for example, in them being flexible in their thinking, in being creative or divergent in their thinking. Um, and in some of the aspects of learning to read early on, um, but also being sensitive to communication, being aware of what's going on in terms of language around them. The second big advantage to me is increasing the economic or the employment advantage of being bilingual. Um, and that is that there are jobs out there for bilinguals, particularly where there's a customer interface where you need uh, the person selling something, for example, to speak two languages, and not just one. Um, then there's advantages. Not just multinational companies, it can be um, lo in the locality where the shopkeeper um, needs two languages to sell um, well. So many advantages, um, overall 10, and I'll quickly read the 10, uh, wider communication, literacy in two languages, broader enculturation, greater tolerance and appreciation of diversity, thinking advantages, raised self-esteem, security and identity, increased curriculum achievement, easier to learn a third language, and economic employment advantages. Now, for any mother, father, parent who has the opportunity to raise children bilingually, who would deny them those 10 advantages by raising them monolingually? Well, that's the question. This happens when one parent is bilingual or multilingual and the other parent is monolingual. The first answer is that ideally before the child is born, or certainly as soon as the child is born, it needs a frank and open and sensitive discussion between the two parents. That is, bring it into the open. Um, don't let it lay latent and hidden. The second answer is that many children become multilingual and bilingual. In only a few decades it's become much more usual for children to become fluent in two or even more languages. Um, so if one looks around the world then becoming bilingual is much more normal these days than it was several decades ago. Another answer is that the parent who is monolingual can learn the language alongside the child. Um, it is not so difficult, in fact it's rather pleasant and rather easy listening to the mother talking to the child in just very, very simple words to start with and the father, uh, for example, picks up very, very quickly. I'm saying mother and father because this is my own experience that I learned a lot of Welsh by simply listening to my wife Anwyn speak uh, Welsh to the children when they were young. And so it's easy enough for one parent to learn uh, a language alongside the child and become reasonably fluent in that language. The other answer is that there's inevitably going to be a common language, for example, around the food table, so that the parent who is monolingual is not going to get um, sidelined. Um, there's going to be a language that everybody uses when everybody's together. And uh, 
So exclusion by the monolingual is not the case. Um, and I would urge parents in this situation to, to have a look at the book. Um, I think it's A6 in the book, where I discuss this a little bit further and try to analyse a little bit the psychology of what's going on in such cases. Um, but in most cases, the sensible solution is to raise the child bilingually. Uh, this happens and some grandparents, particularly who only speak one language, uh, may worry that they're going to be excluded when the child speaks another language because the child is bilingual. And exclusion tends to be the issue with grandparents and other members of the family. In reality, exclusion is not a, a, a problem. The reason is that the child who is bilingual will normally just move into the language of the grandparent when talking to that grandparent or that grandparent is listening. And uh, therefore exclusion doesn't always actually occur. What is needed in this situation is really some education uh, and explanation to the grandparent. Explain in a loving way why the child benefits from being bilingual, what the advantages are, the multiple advantages are for the child in being bilingual, uh, to try to get the parent grandparents to understand the decision by the parents in raising the child bilingually. And often grandparents come round to uh, that point of view and importantly over time we'll see just how easy bilingualism and indeed multilingualism is for the child and uh, perhaps grow to admire the child for having that communicative uh, ability. Some children get very little opportunity to practice at least one of their languages outside the family situation. So the question then is, well, how do parents extend and develop their language in that kind of situation? Don't despair. First of all, it's important that a child uses their language across a variety of different contexts or situations. Um, not just around the food table, not just in doing particular things, but trying to extend their vocabulary, for example, by experiencing a variety of different events. Uh, in the answer in A11 uh, in the book, I talk about visiting beaches, banks, bookshops, swimming pools, sport events, carnivals, cafes, to experience and stimulate language growth. And that is important. Not just homework, not just a sort of a narrow approach to um, getting things correct, but trying to involve pleasurable participation. You know, that's really important, is to make language a pleasure, exciting, enjoyable, not a chore, not something that has to be done and practiced. Another answer is that for some families, um, then visits to relations within the country or abroad is an important way of extending language experience. Um, for example, a trip to grandparents or relatives abroad um, during the summer period or during a vacation time is a way of extending the language because of its using with different people, different situations. Indeed, some children become passive bilinguals, that is, they speak but just understand the other language. Then, in that kind of situation, extending the language experience is quite important. Another ex example of what extending language experience is the use of Skype and webcams. This is the technological age, um, YouTube and so forth. So, connecting with other people via Skype, via webcams and so forth, can give additional language experience. It needs a little bit of creativity, um, but extending vocabulary, for example, can be done. One of the experiences in talking to parents over the years, being that when I talk about the advantages of bilingualism, somebody from the audience will always ask the question, OK, so what are the disadvantages? And in the book, I've been quite open and honest and shared what are the issues and the problems that arise with bilingual children. And so in terms of disadvantages, I think, first of all, there's no such thing as a trouble-free child. Um, 
all children have problems and that can include with bilinguals language problems. But what I need to stress is that don't immediately rush to bilingualism as being the cause of a language problem or an educational problem. Many parents and teachers, doctors, other professionals tend to rush to bilingualism as the cause of a problem, um, like stuttering or language delay. It doesn't have to be, and in the book I thoroughly explore cases where this is and is not the case. What is for sure is that a disadvantage can be the amount of parental effort uh, that is, needs to be put in. It's not always simple and straightforward. For some parents it is. It's, it's something that's natural and easy. For other parents they have to work out how to uh, use the two languages in the family situation, particularly to make sure that one language has enough experience and develops well. So there is parental effort and some parents I know find that hard going. Many do not. I think almost all parents who kept at it and kept stayed on for the rest of the course have found that the outcome, a child with two well-developed languages, is a wonderful, wonderful thing and well worth the effort. A very rare um, disadvantage is when neither language is particularly well developed. While this is mentioned in the literature, it is incredibly rare for this to occur. Most children did do develop at least one language really well. But there is this slight danger in a very few cases of neither language being sufficiently developed when it comes to going to school and being able to work in the sort of the higher language that a school demands. If there is a disadvantage that is discussed amongst academics quite frequently, it is the issue of identity. If somebody has two languages, for example, French and English, well, does, does the child regard themselves as being English or French or Anglo-French or even European? Um, and in what kind of strength and combination? Now, for many children, having dual identities or hyphenated identities is no problem whatsoever. They can even enjoy um, being both British and Finnish or uh, having a United States identity and a Puerto Rican identity. For a few though, there can be identity crises. There can be tensions in identity. This particularly occurs with uh, immigrants and uh, that then needs care. It also, I think, changes over a lifetime. Just as languages are never absolutely equal or never the same over a lifetime, same with identity. Identity changes and children become adjusted to having a hyphenated identity, being sometimes both French and English, of uh, having dual identity, multiple identity, and uh, being slightly different people in different circumstances according to who they're with and then actually enjoy and celebrate that. But there is the issue of identity. There is a quote from the parents book and it comes in uh, section B1 and I found that it's been frequently quoted elsewhere. Uh, I'm very pleased about that because other writers but also speakers have used this uh, in a positive way. Um, I'm going to read it to you. It's possibly my favourite quote from the book. Is children are born ready to become bilinguals and multilinguals. Too many are restricted to becoming monolinguals. No caring parent or teacher denies children the chance to develop physically, socially, educationally or emotionally. Yet we deny many children the chance to develop bilingually and multilingually. I think that says quite a lot and it's also about the advantages of bilingualism in the long term. A pretty typical experience of many parents is that the child stops speaking one language. That can be a very young child and it can be a teenager as well. If it's a very young child, then look at the child in terms of what it's trying to do. 
she or he may be just wanting to communicate in the most effective and efficient manner possible. That is, they're not worried about what language they're using. That's not an issue for them. What they want to do is get their message across in the easiest way possible for them. So the fact that they're not using one language may simply be pragmatic. In that kind of case, then don't stop using the weak language with the child. You can still respond to the child in the other language. Keep giving the child language practice and what seems like passive bilingualism, where they speak one language but uh, only tend to uh, understand and listen in the other language, uh, will change over time. With plenty of practice, um, with changes of circumstances and schooling, for example, then a child may grow in that language. With teenagers, of course, it's a different scenario. During the teenage years, there's the desire to have a different status, to have some degree of independence, perhaps. And therefore, teenagers uh, can quite quickly decide they don't want to speak a language, particularly if they think it's a low status language. And that happens in many situations, not just immigrant situations, but sometimes minority language situations where teenagers rebel, yes, and start speaking the majority language only. Respond with patience to that. With a language, there has to be conviction, not conformity. Telling the teenager they have to speak one language is going to work in the opposite direction. It's better to still keep talking to the child in the language they do not prefer to use, so they get plenty of experience. Um, but let time take its own course. And very often teenagers turn into 20s year olds who want to use both languages. And so very often what seems to be a monolingual teenager blossoms later on into becoming um, a very fluent bilingual. They, in the end, what parents have to do is to sow the seed. They have to try to tend the garden and make sure that the context, the environment of the garden is as good as they can make it for bilingualism to grow. But in the end, the parent can't force the growth of the tender young language plant. They can provide the conditions, but they can't force the colour uh, and the blossoming of that young plant. That is within the child, the teenager, the 20 year old themselves. And very often, a passive bilingual becomes an active bilingual later in life. So don't despair. Most bilinguals mix their languages. That is, they use words from one language when mainly using another language. Children do this quite regularly, but so do adults as well. We find that people mix their languages when they're with other bilinguals. And that when they're with monolinguals, they tend to stick to the language of that monolingual. So mixing a language tends to be more with other bilinguals than with monolinguals. It's also interesting the word that gets used here is mixing is, I suppose, a fairly neutral word, but some people use the word interference, which is a very negative word, is one language interfering with another, which is really not what is occurring, particularly with children who really just want to express themselves in the most efficient and effective way possible. There's a new word and it's called translanguaging. And this is very positive words, which basically implies that children, adults, use the, both their languages to maximal effect in conversation. And they may move from one language to another, even inside the same sentence, but they do that um, to maximise communication. So translanguaging, a good way of looking at it. If you think this is a problem with your children, then one traditional historic answer is language separation, is to try to keep to occasions when the child uses one language and different occasions when the child uses the other language. This happens quite naturally sometimes when, when one parent speaks one language and the other parent speaks a different language and therefore the child naturally addresses the parents in different languages. Um, at food time of course, when there's one common language, but um, using both languages um, in different occasions with different people, different situations, 
may help those parents who are worried about their child mixing. Mixing is also has very valuable aspects to it. For example, um, it can show social distance. You can use one language to show one status or how clever one is. Uh, it's a higher class language. Um, it can also be used mischievously. There is um, a lovely example of my first professor, uh, Professor Webster, unfortunately now no longer with us, who was a Welsh and English speaker and went from Wales to London and uh, went to the theatre and behind him were sitting two ladies. Now, Professor Webster was very tall and very wide and in Welsh, the two ladies were having a conversation thinking he didn't understand and he said, this enormously large person in front of us, we cannot watch the play. Well, Professor Webster kept quiet until the very end of the, the play and simply turned round to the ladies and in Welsh said, thank you, I hope you enjoyed the play. So code switching, translanguaging, mixing languages has a variety of different purposes. And in the, this book, I, I outline at least 10 of them. So what seems to be a problem, it actually can be an advantage for bilinguals. When I've run parent classes in the past, one frequent question which is raised by parents as a problem is my child's two languages are not the same, they're not equal, they're not balanced. And lots of parents seem to worry about this, that a child is stronger in one language rather than the other. I have to say that that is absolutely normal. It is rare for two languages to be equal or balanced in a child or an adult. Um, a child will tend to have one stronger language, particularly if that education is through that language, particularly if most of their experience is through that language. Uh, as an adult, we tend to use perhaps one language more than others in many situations, and therefore that language is stronger. But languages tend to get used in different contexts. We use one language inside the family, another in work. One language in the home, another language in school. One language in the community, with friends and family, perhaps another language for religion. So languages don't necessarily get used for exactly the same purposes. Each language can have a different context, a different purpose, different people, and therefore it's not going to be balanced or equal. The other thing I think that needs to be said here is that languages change over the lifetime. Languages are not stable, they're not fixed. Languages grow and can wane as well. And what may be a weak language in a child may grow to a strong language when they're an adult. A number of children are passive bilinguals, that is, they speak one language but just understand and don't speak the other. But come adulthood, that can change, even reverse, as experiences, employment and enjoyment uh, come into play. There's nothing stable or static about two languages. Change is in order throughout the lifetime. Quite often, with the best of intentions, a professional gives advice to a parent about raising their children bilingually. Examples of a professional might be uh, a doctor um, or a judge. And I want to give you two examples of this and then explain why it is important to get expert advice, particularly when there are problems. The first example comes from the United States and it was a Texas judge who told a mother that raising her five-year-old child in Spanish was abusive and relegated her to the position of a housemaid. The New York Times on the 30th of August 1995 reported this and reported the judge as saying, now get this straight. You start speaking English to this child because if she doesn't do good in school, then I can remove her from your house because it's not in her best interest to be ignorant. So there is an example of a judge giving a mother advice not to raise the child bilingually 
I mean Spanish and English, but for the child to switch into English only. The second example is a personal one, and it comes from uh, a parent class which I was uh, conducting in North Wales in a fairly small uh, area. And along came the doctor, the local doctor to this, a lovely, lovely person. And she challenged me at the end and said, um, look, um, I sometimes have patients come along who have problems with their children. And I often tell them that bilingualism can be a problem and they need to switch away from bilingualism. And I think she was talking particularly the case of a child who was stuttering or stammering. In the audience there was a seven-year-old or even a six-year-old child. I took a risk and I asked the child to come to the front. And there was only about 15, 20 people there, so it wasn't anxiety provoking. And the child came and stood by me and I said, um, tell me, what's your name? And let's imagine his name uh, was James. James, I said to him, tell me, is it difficult to think in two languages? Is it difficult to speak in two languages? And he turned to me and said, basically, don't be so silly. He says, I can talk in two languages all day. I just move from one language to the other very, very easily. It's just natural to me. And I looked at the doctor and said, and there's your answer. And now to give a proper answer is yes, there are times when professionals give advice to parents not to raise their child in bilingually. But you know, if I was going to a doctor, I wouldn't ask for their advice about money. I would ask for advice about something they were expert in. So the first issue is if you're asking a professional for advice about raising children bilingually, are they qualified? Are they really expert? Are they knowledgeable, uh, including from research about bilingualism in childhood? Because if not, it's just amateurish, it's just from uh, the top of the head almost. So it needs expertise and good speech therapists who've been trained in bilingualism, psychologists who have, again, been educated about bilingualism. Teachers as well can be quite expert if they have the right teacher training. And in such cases, they can give good answers. But one of the reasons for writing this book was that so many people appear to be giving answers to real problems which don't come from research, which don't come from uh, experience and expertise. And I've tried my best in this, not just from my own point of view, but using international scholars around the world, um, the cream of research, the very best people who know a lot about bilingualism. And I've tried to use their research, their ideas, their thinking, and putting together what at this point in time seems to be the most expert uh, opinion about not only problems but also possibilities as well.